Hi, beloved daughters. I'm Danielle Kelly. I am excited to share a special message with you. For those of you who were able to attend our last event, Spirit and Truth Worship in October, you already know what I'm going to share because you were there. But for those of you who missed our women's event, I thought it was important for me to share our message virtually with you. The Lord took me on a nice journey during my sabbatical. And when I um, went before I went on the sabbatical, the Lord gave me the theme for our women's ministry this year. And it came in a place of prayer and the, the theme is spirit, exploring spirit and truth worship. What it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. And this phrase and concept comes from John chapter four, where Jesus has this beautiful encounter with um, a Samaritan woman at the well. Now, like I said, God gave me this theme before the sabbatical, and I knew this is what we were going to go after as a women's ministry. However, um, I thought that our first event, I was going to go straight into John 4, but that's God did not have me do that. He saw it fit that I explore what it means to worship Him in spirit and in truth from a different aspect. And as a women's ministry, we have um, a value. One of our core values is vulnerability and authenticity. And we seek to create and cultivate safe spaces for women to feel welcome and heard. And as a pastor's wife and a women's ministry leader, I know I'm called to pioneer this in our church and to essentially break the ice and to go first and so that you know that you're not alone. So vulnerability takes a lot of courage and it can be very scary. And it's scary for me because vulnerability involves risk, y'all. It does. It's risky to put yourself out there to talk about what you've been going through, where you're hurting. And sometimes when you open up, you get hurt. And honestly, sometimes when I've messed up trying to create a space, um, a safe space, but even with messing up, it does not stop me from trying to continue to create a space of vulnerability um, and authenticity in our church because I know that what freedom is on the other side of it. And so today I want to share a lesson that God taught me during my sabbatical. And he taught me um, one thing, like one thing about lamenting and how important it is and how I have been avoiding lament. And when I went on the sabbatical, God was like, now that you're quiet, let's bring this forth. So the message that I'm going to bring to you today in several parts, and this is going to be part one of the message of the beautiful art of lament, emotional honesty with God in our pain. When I started my sabbatical, I thought that I could forecast the level of healing that I would have when I would return. I just thought, yeah, I'm going to get this, this time of rest. And this is how I'm going to be when I come back. Um, to ministry. And to be honest, the way that I returned from um, into ministry was a lot different than I had thought. God had done a deep work of healing in me, deep surgery, soul work during the sabbatical. And to be honest, returning back from the sabbatical, my heart is still tender. Just like when someone goes through surgery and they're in a recovery state, they're not able to go back and do all the things that they could previously do without recovery time. So to be super transparent, even though Pastor John and I have just returned back from sabbatical, I am still in a tender spot and still recovering. And um, one of the things with lamenting that God taught me uh, about during the sabbatical was that, yes, I have been vulnerable with him and I have been open with him about things, but he was showing me areas in my life where I was still not being brutally honest with him and how I was upset with him about some things and how I needed to lament. So we're going to jump into this, but I want to pray for us first. Lord, I thank you so much for every single woman watching this video, whether they're in Chicago West or outside of Chicago West. I pray, God, that you would just move powerfully and that you would allow them to lament, that they would see that there's no shame in it and that they would find your presence and experience healing in lamenting. And Lord, I just pray that um, the women that listen to this, wouldn't just listen to it, but that they would sit and chew on this message and on the scriptures and spend time with you to let you do the full work of healing you want to do in their lives. And I just lift these things up to you in Jesus name. Amen. So let's get into this. So let's talk about lament. 
First, I want to talk about what lament is. And lament is a passionate expression of grief and sorrow or sorrow. And the thing about lament is not a popular word in our society or even in our churches. Some of us may not even fully understand. We may understand what it is to have grief. We may understand what it is to have sorrow, but lament is not, like I said, a popular word. And we tend to avoid prolonged grief or pain when we we often don't respond well to someone else's grief. If someone's grieving or expressing their, their pain, we it makes us uncomfortable and we just kind of want to wrap it up. And sometimes it makes us uncomfortable because it taps into our own grief. No one likes to suffer, y'all. I don't like to suffer and I know you don't. And no one likes the ugliness of brokenness. And we don't like to feel the full weight of hopelessness and despair. And we don't like... Um, things to that are you know when you go to sleep at night y'all you know what i'm talking about like when you have done all the things that you've done you lay down and you put your head on the pillow and the things that you've been shoving down all of a sudden start to bubble up to the surface and we're like time out <laughs> i'm not trying to deal with you and we often try to distract ourselves from that thing we might go on our phones we might go on social media we may eat we may even um tap into some things that we should not be tapping into because we just want to distract ourselves from the grief. And I know for me, you know, when those things come up, I'm like, hold up, I'm trying to go to sleep. This ain't the time. I just want to rest. But during the sabbatical, God brought those things up. And I think back in 2020, this is a great example of how our world collectively um, experienced sudden grief and we were forced into a lament. And some of us expressed that lament and some of us shoved it and stayed silent. And as we come, you know, we're in November right now, but we're to the close of 2023. And when you think about the pandemic happening three years ago, life has just gone back to normal. But I really want to ask uh, ask you, has it really gone back to normal? Many of us still grieve 2020 and many of us still grieve things about our childhood. So that's lament. And the next question I want to pose is like, why, what do we do when we grieve? And how do we express our lament? And where do we start? God used my sabbatical to invite me into lament and not just any lament, but he invited me into a biblical lament and a biblical lament, a lament where my lament moved from this passionate expression of grief and turned into what Mark Volgoff calls a prayer and pain that leads to trust. This is important. Lament is an expression of grief and sorrow, but biblical lament is designed to draw us closer into a deeper trust in the Lord. Lament is found all throughout the Bible. There is a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations by Jeremiah, who was known as the weeping prophet. We read about how God grieved over um uh, grieved over humanity and humanity's sin. We read about mothers who have lost children and husbands and women who grieve having barren wombs. wombs. And the Bible is just full of tragedy and loss while being filled with hope and resurrection. Jesus himself is described as a man of sorrows, acquainted with our grief. Unlike our culture in biblical times, the Jewish culture did not shy away from grieving and lamenting. Instead, it welcomed lament and built in a societal structure to help the process of lament. I think about in Deuteronomy chapter 34, where Moses died, the leader of the Israelites. And the people didn't just grieve for one day, but they grieved for 30 days. And the morning, their mourning was collective and it happened in community. Lament in the Bible was often expressed physically, physically expressed. So there would be loud weeping tearing of their clothes. Um, they would throw ashes on themselves and dirt upon themselves to express the fact that they were lamenting and grieving. And one um, instance in the Bible that comes to mind is when I think about um, one of King David's daughter, I believe her name was Tamar, and how unfortunately one of her brothers raped her and went after the horrific act happened, she tore her clothes. She made it aware that 
an injustice had happened to her and this was wrong and she wasn't going to stay quiet about it. And in our society, that type of expressive lament is only reserved um, for funerals, to be honest. At funerals, if someone wails, if someone cries out, that's perfectly fine. Everybody uh, in our society understands that's an appropriate place. But in, in lament, that expressive lament may be appropriate behind closed doors when we're by ourselves, but when we're at our churches, when we're in public settings, we don't often create a space and it's not in our society socially acceptable to express our lament in that way, a biblical lament. And this year has been wild for my family, y'all. We have been running, earlier this year, we were running on fumes tired than tired could be. And we were dealing with a lot. Many of you in our Chicago West family know that my brother-in-law passed away. We had um, earlier this year, and it was a, a really tra traumatic way that he passed. He passed, um, had been battling cancer for many years, um, for a long time. And it, it was hard. And over the years with ministry, we have dealt with um, loss of relationships and unexpected shifts that, um, that led to our sabbatical. And the thing about loss of relationships that sometimes loss of relationships can come about in a good way, like people coming to our church and transitioning for a good reason. And sometimes the transition isn't for the best reason or a pleasant one. But each of those situations, whether they're good or bad, create loss and grief. I just want to name a few things that I've been grieving and what God showed me when I slowed down on that sabbatical, what I, um, I wasn't even realizing the grief that I was carrying. So I'm just going to name a few. I was grieving some things that were broken in my marriage. I was suddenly grieving not being able to worship with my church family because when you're on a sabbatical, for us, we removed ourselves from our normal Sunday routine and I was grieving that. I was grieving the pain of being hurt by the body of Christ. Just because I'm a pastor's wife doesn't mean I have church hurt. We all have church hurt in some ways. Um, but I was just sitting there processing like, man, I have grief that I have not processed. Um, grieving loss, friendships, and relationships. I was grieving how my untreated trauma was impacting me and my family and my relationships. I was grieving dreams that have died and grieving that being a stay, you know, a couple years ago, God called me to be a stay at home mom, which I never thought in a million years that I would do, but I knew that's what he called me to. And even though he called me to it, it took a toll on me. So I had to realize that even though I knew I was doing something that God called me to do, I had to grieve the fact that it took a toll on me emotionally. I was grieving the ways that I've just dropped the ball as a parent, y'all, because any parents out there that can relate. And even if you're not a parent, you might relate to um, dropping the ball in a relationship or with your with your parents or with um with your friends or with a sibling. I was also grieving the fact that um my I'm 38 and even though God has done a miraculous work in my relationship with my get my dad, with my father, I was still grieving the fact that even after all these years, I still carry the wounds of my dad abandoning me when I was a little girl. And I was also grieving the consequences that I had to bear for other people's actions and decisions and sins that it just didn't seem fair. You know, it's like, why do I have to grieve? Why do I have to deal with this pain that I did not cause? I was also grieving the fact, y'all, that God in all his sovereignty was letting it happen. And I couldn't understand why. And here's the thing about me. I believe that God is in control of all things. Do I believe that he creates every situation? No, because there's an enemy, the devil, that prowls around like a roaring lion and God gives us free will to make our choices. But I had that tension of knowing like, God, you're sovereign. You're in control of, over all these things. Like, why are you letting this happen? You know, like I said, I was still grieving the fact that even though God has done redemption in my relationship with my dad, I still grieve at 38 that he walked out the door when I was in second grade and never looked back. When I look at my life story, there have been a series of loss that have hit me like one domino after the other, knocking the next loss into motion. 
And sure, I've cried along the way and I've even lamented over the years, but God showed me that there was much more to grieve. And with each new loss, my grief was compounding. It was just packing in and I can no longer ignore my grief or deal with it on the surface. It was time for me to invite God into my grief and it was time to heal and it was time to go deeper. So I want to ask you, like, are you ready to invite God into your grief? And the first step that he did, the first thing he addressed after saying, you know, we're going to deal with this grief is he started to address the reasons why I avoid lamenting. There's three for me, and these three may not be yours, but I, as I share mine, I want you to just sit and ponder and pray and ask God, what are the reasons why I avoid lamenting? For me, the first reason was I was avoiding the depths of my pain. I'm like, what is at the, what is on the other side of this grief, Lord? I know you want me to grieve, but just actually facing the pain and all of it was just like a bottomless, dark pit to me. And I'm like, what is at the bottom of that pit? Is there anything on the other side? Do I really need to revisit some things that have caused me such pain because we all understand that, right? Part of the reason why some of us just don't want to go to the pain is because we don't want to go back to that traumatic moment. We don't want to go back to where we were violated by somebody. We don't want to go back to one of our major failures. We don't want to revisit a sin that broke our hearts and broke the heart of God. We don't want to really go back to those things. It's very natural to want to move on um, past those things, but in order to lament, you got to go there, you know? So he's like, number one, honey, I know you've been avoiding that pain. And I know you don't know what's at the bottom of that pit, but we're about to go there. The second thing that he addressed with um, why I was avoiding lament was I simply didn't trust him. And I was really angry with him. Yes, I trust the Lord with my salvation, but he had to just this emotional honesty <laughs> that he got with me about was like, Come on and just tell me how you really mad at me. Tell me how angry you are about the things that have happened in your life. Tell me, tell me, tell me. And I'm not going nowhere. I want you to tell me. And, you know, I think about, um, yeah, I'll, get, I'll use this example later, but I think about my kids and how they know I'm a safe person, but sometimes they're really angry with me and upset and I can tell they're upset. And I'm like, why don't you just talk to me about why you're upset? And they're like, no. I don't, I don't want to talk to you at all. And they may even say like, I'm not upset with you, but they don't want to hug me. They don't want to sit next to me. They're creating physical distance from me. And, um, that's what God dealt with. He's like, let's just, just be honest with me about how angry you are, but also be honest with me about how you don't trust me. And it's like, so that's hard for me to acknowledge and to admit to him because I'm like, you've done so much in my life and I've trusted you in all these other areas and you've just moved miraculous ways. Why don't I trust you right now in this? But he's like, tell me about it. The third reason that I was avoiding my lament was pride, y'all. Pride. I was simply refusing his comfort because I wanted to receive it in my way, in my timing and not his. I'll, I've shared with a lot of the women how God has been calling me to write and I have submitted in some ways to that. But oftentimes I avoid writing because when I write, there's like a, a volcano that erupts and all these things that were hidden or that I ignored all of a sudden come to the surface. And I'm like, I felt God over um, the course of this year, even to be honest, not just during the sabbatical in the past, asking me, not even asking me, commanding me to write, spend time with him in that place of writing to help me deal with that pain, to meet me in the grief. But I simply was refusing. And I think about, you know, I'm just going to use my kids as an example about, <laughs> have you ever, and, and if you're not a parent, think about your niece, think about, um, children that you observe. Have you ever seen a child hurt themselves and you go over and you're like trying to comfort them, but the way that you're comforting them is not what they want or they're just too upset. And they're like, no, leave me alone. 
I'm hurting. And you're like, let me help you. And they're like, no, I got it. I'm on my own. Leave me alone. But, or, but as they're rejecting you, they're like, I'm in so much pain. And you're like, I'm here to comfort you. Let me comfort you. But they reject it. Oftentimes we can be like that. I have been like that with God or when he brings certain people to be a part of the comforting to me. I'm like, I don't want that. Why you got to bring that person to comfort me? How come this person can't? Can you relate to that? Can you relate? So I want to just ask you, what are some of the reasons you avoid lamenting? I gave you my three, my three. I was avoiding the depths of my pain. I didn't trust God and was angry with him and pride were three reasons why I was avoiding um, lamenting. So I want you to sit and ponder what are some of the reasons you are avoiding lament? Now, in part two of the next video, I'll jump into the cost of why we don't lament. Until next time, remember you are loved.